We're here to talk today about bad games. <laughs> These are probably the bad games you were expecting, right? If you don't know, Super Nose Arc 3D is like a crappy Wolfenstein clone for the SNES where you lose a slingshot to shoot at goats. Made very well known and popular by the angry video game nerd in his review, it's a very common thing to review games that are bad games in a funny and or yelling manner. Something that was invented by a mystery science theater. Perhaps. Or a one theater time. of science mystery in the year 3000. But there's nothing interesting to say. This game is just bad in every conceivable way. And we all know about it. I like how this got ha 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 and this was like, oh. <laughs> At least they know what it is. It's not like anyone who didn't know what this is, right? You kids are lucky because the Whoa. internet, the internet <laughs> exists. Googling. When I was young, I was at a Sears department store, and I had this memory of seeing a Zelda game that wasn't on the Nintendo, and I couldn't figure out what it was. I wasn't even sure if I remembered it or it was just a dream. It was not until the internet that I could look it up and find out that that was real. That shit existed. More than one of them. Three of them. Now... <laughs> This is actually sort of retro cool nowadays. Shaq's pretty good in Salty Bed. <laughs> but the thing is, the mother of all bad games <laughs> from the modern era is not the most famously bad game of all time. <laughs> right, this game is famously bad, right? When people talk about bad games, right, this is like the number one game that always comes up as like the quintessential bad game, E.T., right? And it's famously bad mostly because they hyped it a whole bunch. Because imagine, at the time this came out, E.T. was the biggest thing. The way that right now, what's the biggest thing right now? The Breaking Bad's pretty big, right? So it was, it was huge. It was huger than ever, anything you could possibly imagine. You know what? It was the Star Wars of that year. Right. It was so big. Uh, so when the E.T. video game coming out, the hype was just enormous. They printed as more cartridges than there were Ataris, right? It was, right? And because of, like, that whole meta of it, Right? And the fact that, you know, the mysterious, you know, landfill of a million cartridges and all that nonsense. It's sort of famously bad, but is the game itself actually that bad? The game is legendarily bad, but what is a legend? Legends usually are larger than life. They're not necessarily true. Someone in the audience, I overheard, like, oh, you've actually got a copy. You can get this for a penny. Do you know how many copies of this there are? <laughs> And even with all the ones they dumped in the landfill. And two, how many of you have actually played this game? Okay, oh. quite a few. Quite a few. A lot of people haven't. All right, all right, I have a secondary question. How many of you have played this game? Uh, right. Wait, now people are clapping like this is a good game. This game is no less good than this game. They are equally good. Right. Yars Revenge is sort of like retro chic. It's like famous. They're like, oh yeah, Yars Revenge, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that was a good one. No, you can't freaking play that game. Yeah, tell me what the fuck you do. <laughs> By the way, you're the bug, first of all, on the left, right? What, what the hell is that field of static nonsense? What, you go into it, you come out on the other side. What the hell just happened? Yeah, and that little biddly bit, that's not a bullet. That's just kind of following you around. If it touches you, you fucking die. <laughs> You can't get in there where the other spaceship thing is. You have no clue what the hell to do in this game. And what do you think? Do you think that you shoot this guy? No, that's not what you do. So, what we're gonna do now, what we're gonna do now, is play a little bit of E.T. Are you guys no. going O because of E.T. or because of the pony? Yes. Ponies, yes, E.T., no. Okay. All right, so check this out. We got E.T. here. <laughs> all right, so first of all, that's, that's pretty good music for an Atari right there. Right? And that graphic, that is amazing shit. Look at that. That actually looks like E.T. This game is as old as me, 82. All right, so this game is famously bad, right? So let's just play it. Let's see what happens. All right, that looks like E.T. E.T. coming down in a spaceship. Looks pretty good. Kind of walking around. Walking around. It makes sense so far. It's not too bad. I guess I've got some live gauntlet style. Oh, I can teleport. Oh, look, if I hit the button, it does whatever. I guess I summoned Rome. I don't, all right. Let's walk around a little bit. It's the number at the bottom that keeps going down. Oh, what the fuck? All right, all right. I guess game over. I guess I fell in a pit. 
I guess there's I think pits. you know how to get out of the pit. Remember that scene in E.T. when he fell into the pit The and Atari only has one button. It's not hard to try right, to figure out what to do. So, I'm going to hit the one button. You flew out of the pit. Uh, hey, that's actually pretty good. That's a DC or ship right there. So this game is pretty complicated, it seems. And the main complaint when people say this game is bad is that they don't know what the fuck they're doing. They can't understand. The game is really straightforward. Fall into the pits, get the three pieces, phone home, and wait. That's it. The, get the instruction book tells you how to play. The game. And we're already one third of the way through this game. Yeah, we're doing pretty well here. There's humans that pop out occasionally and steal shit uh, from Uh, yeah, that's not good. <laughs> and Elliot comes around. Now, the game... Now, that guy is going to steal my piece if he finds... Oh, he didn't see me. Nice. So I was hiding. So, the point I really want to make here is that this game... It's bad. It's pretty bad. But all Atari... Oh, he's going to steal my fucking piece. Get away from... Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> the game's not that bad. Meanwhile... What do I do? I can shoot it. Go over there and eat at it. Launch that thing. That thing that came at you like lightning and was completely undodgeable? What's that static field do? All right, so what you have to do to beat Yar's Revenge is go touch that ship. And if you touch it, then a laser comes out of the left and you have to aim that and fire it while not being hit by that missile and avoiding that swirl. It's just as stupid and complicated, and really, E.T., to get back to our point, if you just read the instruction book for any Atari game, they're not confusing at all. They are really straightforward. That page says, go get the three phone pieces. Here's what the powers do. Watch out, don't fall into the wells. It sucks to get out of them. Be careful. Yeah, people today, right? You gotta remember the conscience. In 82, right? The games did not have enough memory, enough graph, even screen resolution to give you any sort of instructions or help or anything. The game had to be completely intuitive for you to just plug it in and play it. And there was a period of time in like the NES, SNES days where that's what people did. You know, which is why they started decreasing instruction manuals. But before then, instruction manuals is like the first thing you did when you opened a box on the way home from Toys R Us is read that instruction manual, right? Because the game didn't have anything in it to help teach you. And if the game wasn't intuitively designed, which was only the best of the best games were that well designed, you could learn everything there was to know just by playing them, you needed to know that. Right? And people play to the ET today and they say, what the hell, this game is awful, right? Take because any Atari game. Instructions. Any Atari game is equally incomprehensible without, without the, instructions. the instructions. So why is ET so well remembered as being bad? Because it was bad at being a blockbuster game. It wasn't bad at being an Atari game. In fact, it is above average for an Atari game from that year that it came out. Right, remember, when a game comes out, when someone makes a game, they have, they have a goal, a thing the game is trying to achieve, right? Usually make lots of money for the person who made it. But, you know, there's, there's sort of like other goals besides that. So the goal of E.T. was to be like the huge hit, right? It was aiming for the top. Like, this is going to be the game of games for the Atari. E.T. is the biggest thing ever. And it failed at that. Right? It was bad at the thing it was trying to do. It was bad at a lot of other things as well, but it's good at being really funny. Right? Every game is good at something, no matter how bad it is. Right? And no game is just, you can't be generally bad, right? Every game is bad at something. So, the whole point of this panel, a lot of you probably thought we're going to just an angry video game nerd, ego raptor. Let's yeah, know about bad games. Yeah, you expected. That's on YouTube. You know us already, people who know us already. You can watch that on YouTube. Yeah. We're going to talk about the fact that games are not bad. They are bad at certain things. So if you want to say a game is bad, and you can't say why it's bad... Or what it's bad at... Then shut up. <laughs> a lot of people on the internet, they're just, you know, they don't have very, uh, I don't know, intellectual discussions. They're just like, that game oh, you're sucks. Already, I don't like that game. You're already crapping all over the crowd. I am. How well did that go with the Q&A on uh, Friday? I don't know. I hope these people weren't there. <laughs> so... <laughs> So let's go through some games and talk about what it means for a game to be bad. Now, Candyland is bad at being a game. It's really not a game. If anyone still remembers the rules to Candyland, all you do is basically reveal cards and do what they say. You don't make any decisions. So who wins and loses Candyland is based on the shuffle of the deck and who goes first. And when I was a kid, even as a kid, I understood this, and I stacked the deck to give me Queen Frostine immediately. Cheer. <laughs> Queen Frostine is the best. Now, here's the thing. We're saying this is bad at being a game. It's not a game. Gamers will usually say Candyland isn't actually a game. 
But yet, colloquially, it is a game. The word game is used to describe that. That is a board game. It's usually the first board game that any kid plays in the with their States, family. At least. Yeah, in Europe, it'll be like, I guess, Uncle Wiggly. Yeah, maybe. But it's good at these other things, and it is a game. For us to say that it is not a game is a no true Scotsman, because the word game can mean a lot of things. It can mean a competitive test of skill. It can mean something you shoot when you go hunting. It can mean uh, a series of interesting decisions. It can mean an interactive amusement. If we play patty cake, that is a game. So to say that this is not a game is the thing that gamers like to do, where they want to shit all over something they don't respect. Like, oh, MOBAs aren't games. Because they don't like MOBAs. F1 isn't it's like a sport. when people say something's not a sport. It's like they're just trying to shit on it. And it's like, no, there's a definition of sport. Does it fall in that definition? Yes, then it's a sport. It's, so it Candyland... It's good or bad or anything. Candyland is good. There are sports that suck. There are a lot of things that are games that suck. Candyland is good at introducing kids to numbers and counting and the idea of a game. Candyland is good at teaching a kid that, oh, maybe this game is random. Smart kids early on realize the game is random and ask for better games. It's good at teaching kids to recognize colors. It's good at bringing a family together to do something fun. Uh, it's good at having all these memorable characters and telling good stories about the good old Candyland. So the real trouble is the word game. Candyland is bad at being an ortho game. This is a word that Richard Garfield, you might know him from Magic the Gathering. Yeah. And all the, yeah, he wrote a book with some friends. And ortho game is a word he coined. Ortho means straight, like a straight right. game. Orthogonal, diagonal. So an ortho game is a game that is primarily or is a competitive test of skill. A game that has some sort of way to win, right. to it's rank. Like tennis is an ortho game, right? Uh, Settlers of Catan is an ortho game, right? You're competing against other people to win. Right? Candyland is bad at being an ortho game. And look, now that we have this word ortho game, I'm not going to make anyone mad if I say this isn't an ortho game because we have a very specific definition and it doesn't impinge upon someone's self-identity. If I tell someone they're not a gamer because they only like games like Candyland, that's impinging on their self-identification as a gamer. That's mean. That's not productive. You're not an ortho gamer is a perfectly legitimate criticism of someone's like of games. Instead of going being mad at you, they'll just be really confused by you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to a real game, though. Monopoly is bad at ending. <laughs> Now, really, Monopoly is also, it's interesting because people talk about Monopoly. We're at PAX, so everyone remembers Monopoly as this terrible game. It's like an archetypical bad board game. And yet, it's one of the most popular board games in the entire world forever. Yeah, I mean, the good things that Mon right, Monopoly's goal originally was to teach people how capitalism sucked. <laughs> right? And apparently, it's done the opposite. <laughs> So it failed at its goal. It was bad at what it was trying to do. You were supposed to win this game and feel bad about winning. Like, wow, I just won because I got all the properties first. It's like, no, I won because I, I got all the properties first. I was an first. evil landlord who friggin' ripped off all of my uh, tenants. But right? why is this game bad at ending? Why does it go on forever? One, most Americans play the game wrong. Yeah, how many of you have actually read the rule book as opposed to being taught by someone it's else? Packed. There's people who know. Yeah, not everybody. <laughs> not everybody. So, yeah, you're not supposed to put any money on fucking free parking, guys. That's not in the rules. In fact, the rules say don't do that. Also, in the original Monopoly, when you land on a property, you don't just buy it. You auction that shit. Well, you can buy it. Yeah. If you do not buy it, then it gets auctioned off. So, look, people who play Monopoly, the game has this legend, this sort of oral tradition of the rules. Parents teach children. The children grow up, have kids, and teach their children. They teach the wrong rules because none of them have ever read the rules. When I owned Monopoly as a kid, there weren't rules in the box. They were lost like when my parents were young. My parents had the deluxe edition. We had twice as much money, which is really helpful for putting lots of money on free parking. Yeah, you know what I did? I played, <laughs> I played with a calculator. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Eventually. So Monopoly is good at all these things that, you know, family, same things we said about Candyland, but it's bad at being a good game. It's bad at being an ortho game. It's bad at being fun because it goes on forever, and it goes on forever because of the way it's designed. Right. It has a bad end game mechanic. Right. This is what's known as a hostage game, right? The game keeps you hostage, right? You lost. That guy over there has Boardwalk and Park Place and all the oranges and all the yellows, and he's got a huge pile of money. You've got like 500 bucks left. But you have to sit there for another hour as you roll the dice and wait until you randomly land on one of his spaces so he can actually kill you off. Or the game has trapped you. You, if you're losing, can trap him hostage. Just He knows he won. He did win. But you sit there and say, let's keep playing. If you quit, I win. <laughs> the game has trapped everyone there, right? 
It's, it's, it happens in a lot of games, and the reason, the way this happens in games is when the games don't end as soon as they're already decided. If you look at something like StarCraft, right? In StarCraft, there would be situations where it's like, okay, that guy won, but he's hiding one unit somewhere, right? And it's like, you gotta go find him, and that's, that's, you're, you're being held hostage. So what did they do? They added stuff to where it's like, okay, yeah, we're just gonna auto light up that guy so you can go shoot him down. Right? They sort of had a solution to their hostage problem. You'll hear game designers usually use the term win more. There's winning and then there's winning more. Win more ends a game that's already over, like Advance Wars. If I'm losing, I'll just start pumping out mechs. It'll take you hours to fight through them. The win more is he starts pumping out bombers. Bombers aren't useful in the mid-game, but they end the game. So it seems like what we're saying is that these games are all bad, in a sense, because they don't involve skill. They're generally actually pretty random, and they take forever and all these things, but yet Longshot is a game that is almost completely random. Literally, all this game does is, like, you bet on horses. You can go to the horse track and basically bet on these little plastic guys without actually harming or involving any real horses whatsoever, and it's the same damn thing. So, this game is great, despite being random bullshit. Well, it's great at... Having Being. a huge party time. Yeah. Right? You bring this thing out and people go crazy. And we, we, we played this, we named all the horses, and we're like, go, Derp, go. Herp, herp, derp, herp, derp, herp's in the lead, derp's in the lead. <laughs> you know, I think number five is like Rainbow Dash. It's like, go, Rainbow Dash, come on, you can do it. <laughs> So we're not saying games have to be these hardcore tests of still. Games are supposed to be fun. If you're not having fun, don't play a game. A game is, if a game is bad at being fun, it is a shit game. Right. A game has a purpose. It's like you have this game and there's a thing you want to do right now. Maybe you want to laugh. Maybe you want to see who's smarter, me or him. Maybe you want to, you know, see who's got faster fingers, right? There's a purpose of a game. There's a goal of a game. There's a thing that it is, it is for, right? And a bad game is a game that is bad at the thing you were using it for. A lot of times, a game is good at something, and people just use it for something else, right? So they think it's bad, but it's not, right? Like, if you use a fighting game to, you know, for funniness, I mean, I guess there's a few funny fighting games. Well, Shaq Dive Fu. Kick. Yeah, Shaq Fu, right? But it's actually, that's a skill game, though. It's yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. It's real good. Um, all right? All right. So, speaking of games that people use for the wrong thing. <laughs> We're kind of famous for having run this lecture at like five packs is called Beyond Dungeons and Dragons, where we love D&D, but we crap all over it for an hour. Because Dungeons and Dragons is great at a particular kind of game. It's great at going into a dungeon and hitting things with swords and doing maximum average damage every round. It's really bad at most other stuff. If you want to play the Elven Court drama, this is the worst system you could possibly use for no, that. Well, it's not the worst, but it's among the worst. I guess Cobalt's Ate My Baby would be worse for Elven Court drama. Cobalt's Ate My Baby would be great for Elven Court drama. <laughs> all hail King Torg. <laughs> But Dungeons & Dragons is bad at story-driven games. It's bad at the role-playing stuff, but yet, people who play role-playing games and don't enjoy them, and you've all been in this boat, I was in this boat a lot, playing D&D, the combat starts, and everyone else looks like they're having fun, but you're not. You're bored. You want this fight to end, but you know it's going to go on for like four fucking hours. You like it the fight to end? I like it the fight to end. I like it the fight to end. At RIT, I started playing pacifist. Whenever a fight started, I was like, I'm pacifist, I'm not fighting, my character runs away and hides, and then I went across the street and played Counter-Strike until the fight was over. <laughs> True story, bro. Now, Dungeons & Dragons, while it's good at what it's good at, the problem is people who say Dungeons & Dragons is a bad game say it because they're using Dungeons & Dragons to do things it's not designed to do. Right. A lot, you know, think about this. We just showed Monopoly, right? We could roleplay Monopoly. Good sir, you have landed on my Atlantic Avenue. You will be owing me $750 now. Atlantic Avenue is run down and garbage. I refuse to pay. In fact, I'm hiring an army to take it over. Really? Where are you getting this army from? I got a dog. Go boardwalk. All those soldiers are drunken in my bars. I have a hotel. dog. I have a dog in a car wearing a thimble. Uh, but too bad it got run over by the railroad. Now, you play D&D. How often does your game master just say, All right, dude, you're talking to this townsperson? Role play it out. Just role play it out. Let's see where this goes. That's bullshit. Are there any rules in the Monopoly rulebook about role playing? No. There's nothing in there about roleplay. Are there any but rules we, in the can... Dungeons and Dragons rulebook about roleplay? There's one. It says you guys should roleplay and you do whatever you want. If I go into the Monopoly rulebook and I write, you guys should probably roleplay while you play this, do whatever you want. Does that make Monopoly roleplaying a game? No. Alright? You can roleplay freaking anything. A roleplaying game is when there's actually some freaking rules in the book about roleplaying. Like, you must roleplay this. Tell a story. Right? Not the freaking Dungeons Dragons doesn't mean anything. All the rules in that book are about stabbing and magicking and blowing up with the fireballs. Every single one of them. Treasures, that kind of shit. Not a role-playing game. 
So Cards Against Humanity. <laughs> now, a lot of people had fun with this game, but I'm going to say that it's actually a pretty bad game, and here's why. Apples to Apples was the first game that was widely known that did this, and you all played Apples to Apples. It was stupidly popular, but it was broken. After the first few rounds, everyone ran out of cards, and all they have left in their hand are proper nouns that they don't recognize. Yeah, I don't know any of those freaking famous people in Apples to Apples, so I'm just like, uh... It's like celebrities from the early 2000s. Great. Yeah, so I'm like, okay, this card, I don't know who it is, none of my cards go with that. Just whatever, I just want to get rid of this and draw a new one. But you played Apples to Apples, and what was the most fun? The inappropriate answer. It stood out. The inappropriate answer was the whole reason anyone ever played Apples to Apples. And it was actually kind of funny because Apples to Apples wasn't overtly dirty. So when you had a dirty answer, it was always an innuendo. So that just sort of amplified its power. But it didn't happen often enough. It happened maybe three, four times a night. Yep. But, the, but from a game design perspective, it was actually bad at being a game. Most people didn't even read the rule book. They kind of just played. And like we said, you'd run out of good cards almost immediately. And then the game was boring and you're stuck there playing with your family. This game took the good part of Apple Staples and made it the entire game. So the first few times you play this, holy shit, this is incredible, <laughs> right? I mean, you just play this, every card is dirty, every card is hilarious, right? You're just, everyone's peeing themselves and falling over with laughter, right? And then you play it the second time, and it's still good, right? You see some repeat cards, but we'll see it's still good. And then you buy some expansions, but after, even with the expansions, you played it seven, eight times. It's like, I've seen all these cards, there is no combination. Maybe once, there'll be just a combination of cards you've already known, but not in that combination, it's funny once, maybe. And the replay value is like, if right you play this game play. a lot, it, uh, one, it's not a good ortho game. It's not a test of skill. I mean, you could say but that it's not maybe... trying to be that. It's just trying to be fun party time with friends, and it succeeds at that, but only for a very short time. That's why I think it's most popular at conventions and places like this. You play it once a year, twice a year, with a big group of strangers, slightly drunk in a hotel lobby. It's great at that. But if you play this every day, you're going to get really fucking sick of this game. So... The other thing I'd like to point out is that this game, you know, we talk about ortho game. Maybe we need a word for this too. Cards Against Humanity is really an ideo game. I D I O. Ideo That's means. That's word Rim made up. I made it up. Because he's really trying to be cool, but he's not. I want this word to be used because it's useful. Ideo games are games. Ideo means unique or personal. It's a game that you play that might not be a test of skill, but that causes a personal outcome. Our game right now, this front row, we play Cards Against Humanity. Our set of cards and our set of jokes was a unique experience. It'll be slightly different every time people play. Right. It wasn't about winning or losing. It was about creating, you know, something. Like, Dwarf Fortress would be an ideal game, right? Yep. You play it alone, and it's not about winning and losing, because you're going to lose. Losing is fun, Dwarf Fortress, right? But it's about creating, you know, you create your fortress, right? There's your story that happened in the course of that fortress that is unique. No one else is going to get that exact same Dwarf Fortress, the exact same thing happening, right? You're just sort of almost, it's like writing a story just for you. That's, that's an ideal game. So, Yahtzee. How many of you have played Yahtzee? Who, knows how to, who doesn't know how to play Yahtzee? Wow, okay. all right, it's right. For now, some reason, none of our friends knew how to play Yahtzee, so you're expecting sort of the opposite result. Yeah, Yahtzee is a bad game by most gamers' perspectives because you've played this game, you know the odds of a D6. You know the odds of five D6. I hope you do. There's a million games that have this mechanic. You know, how many times you teach someone King of Tokyo, oh, it's just Yahtzee with a couple of pieces. Yeah, you play, what's the, not ground floor, the other one. Oh, uh, Skyline. Skyline. It's like, it's just Yahtzee with building. Roll through the ages, all these games. Roll through the ages, just Yahtzee. Yahtzee is fantastic at teaching you how to be good at games. Because you, if you're a young kid, you have to figure out the, the, the odds of the dice. You have to figure out the odds of rolling a full house versus four of a kind. You have to learn that you never go for an inside straight. That'll help you out a lot later in life. Yeah. The thing is that Yahtzee, what was Yahtzee trying to be? Well, it was trying to be a family game. That's how it was marketed, right? But it was trying to be an ortho game, right? Who is the smartest in this group? The problem is the skill cap is really low. If we played Yahtzee with some of the people in this room, we all know the same things. We equally have the a level of smartness to make the best possible moves at Yahtzee. Therefore, it's just random luck of the dice that will win unless somebody's Jigboo Jones and can freaking roll whatever they want, right? Now, there's a trouble here. Because bad at being an ortho game is still not nuanced enough. Yahtzee is good or bad depending on the level of skill of the players. If you're all kind of dim or you're all in like third grade, Yahtzee is great. If you're a little bit smarter, Yahtzee is not a good game because you're just, you're not making any decisions. You're playing your perfect odds solitaire. But there's still one more manifold level of Yahtzee. 
paying attention to how well everyone else is doing. So ask yourself this question. Is there any reason not to play Yahtzee in parallel? Is there any reason for me not to just do all my roles in a row while Scott is simultaneously doing all of his roles, and then at the end we tally up our scores? Is there any reason not to do that? And the... <laughs> if you're a pack... really don't have 10d6? Really? I think I've got 10d6 in my pocket. <laughs> so... The answer is that it does matter. Yahtzee still has things to teach people who are otherwise pretty good at games because all games have this idea that you can apply one or more techniques or heuristics. Each one has a return in terms of its sort of your skill or a return on how likely you are to win. Right, because remember, when you play Yahtzee with other people, you're not just trying to get the highest score possible, right? In which you would be pretty conservative in your rolling, right? You're just trying to beat the other people. So if Rim gets mad unlucky and like has to write a zero and his four of a kind, then it's like, ooh, now I can take a risk on something, right? Because he failed so much. If Scott's crushing me, I'm going to go for decreasingly good odds. I'm going to take bigger risks. Taking bigger risks... Otherwise, he's not going to win. He's already can't be conservative. And you see the same thing in a lot of games. Look like NFL football. It's like, we're losing. There's 30 seconds left. Let's try the onside kick. We got no hope, right? We got to try the onside kick. We got to try the Hail Mary, right? You would never do that in the early game. You would never do that in a close game. Right? So Yahtzee teaches you that same thing. When you're behind, you got to take a big risk. Right? When you're ahead, you can just lock shit down and make it even harder for that risk to succeed. So when you say a game is bad at being an ortho game, you still have to think about the audience and the context and realize that there are... Like, for example, chess. Here's a great example. The first order technique is act randomly. You're probably not going to do so well. Your second order technique is try to anticipate one move ahead. Try to guess, if I do something, what is the thing the other person will do? But try to read three ahead, four ahead, five ahead, 20 ahead. The more you read ahead, there's a lot more mental effort involved and a lot more memorization and a lot more skill that you have to bring to the table, but there's a decreasing return. The difference in your chance of winning between reading 10 ahead and 11 ahead is much smaller than the difference between reading one ahead and zero ahead. Very few games actually max out at a point where you cannot get better because we're humans, we're fallible, we're not perfect, we fuck up. Scott more than me. Sure. <laughs> soccer. Oh, uh, I fucked up the slides. This is the wrong picture. Uh, yeah, that doesn't look like soccer. That's better. That looks like that's soccer better. to me. <laughs> yeah. Soccer is awful, right? Soccer could be good, right? But the major problem with soccer is, of course, diving, right? Most soccer... <laughs> but now you get it. Now you get it. <laughs> Yeah. We went to, we were at Pax Aus, and yep. we, while we were there, of course, we stayed there a while. We're not traveling all that way for no reason. Uh, we went to an AFL game, right? Footy. Australian Rules Football, the footy, right? Basically, these guys are playing nonstop with no pads, and as far as I can tell, you can do anything you want to anyone at any time. <laughs> Tackle people. A dude who jumped up in the air to catch the ball. A guy wrapped his arms around his legs and basically slammed his body into the ground. He just got up and kept running. The ref was looking right at him and just didn't even blink. See, I thought that sometimes in soccer they're diving and sometimes they're not. It's like, no, they're just always diving or they're super pussies. Because, <laughs> like, a guy barely kicked you in the leg and you tripped and you laid on the ground crying and you're, like, twice the size of me. Really? Now, even better, I was reading, I did a bunch of research for this panel because when you're going to shit all over a really popular game, you've got to be ready to defend yourself. So, with soccer, there's posture. When you fall to the ground and you hurt yourself as a human being, you make certain movements and you take certain postures that are very hard to fake. Soccer players, when they're diving, tend to take this particular pose where their leg goes up in the air and they push their chest out. Humans do not do that when they're experiencing pain. So there are ways to detect with technology if someone is diving or not. Soccer and studies show that people okay. dive more often when they're losing or when a game is close, or when they would get a scoring opportunity. People also dive more often in the offensive zone than in the defensive zone because then they'll be granted a penalty kick, right? In soccer, most it's very hard to score a goal. It's a super low-scoring game, so even one goal is super important. And it's really hard to score a goal just in the regular soccer play when the ball is live. One league, one soccer league that I, I couldn't get a lot of numbers on this stuff because a lot of soccer leagues don't publish stats like Because they don't use computers. And football do. But the stat I found was that in this particular soccer league in the UK, 30% of games were decided by a free kick. In other words, 30% of games were decided by flopping. The game is just that bullshit. The game incentivizes. 
the game is bad at being a pure test of this skill because part of the skill that you're testing that people don't want to talk is about acting. is acting and faking it. Yeah. So this is a problem because it bubbles up into all the other parts of the game. Yeah. Now, conversely, what's soccer good at? Soccer is really good at building up a crowd of rowdy hooligans. <laughs> It's really good at creating like international rivalries and, and you know And international and bonds. Soccer unifies the entire non-United Statesian world. <laughs> it's really good at that. It, the community, people start playing soccer at a young age and grow up. People watch soccer, get into it. What did they say in Costa Rica when they started New Town? What's the oh, first thing? So I was know? in Costa Rica and, and the, our guide basically said, yes, we passed all these little towns in the villages. And she's like, oh, that town was just built. In this order, any town that gets built in Costa Rica gets a church, a football field, a doctor's office, and a grocery store. <laughs> so soccer is good at a lot of things, but because it's good at those things, that's why it's bad at fixing this problem. The community aspect is more important to the people who are fans of soccer than fixing the diving problem. In fact, a lot of soccer fans see the problems with officiation in soccer as a good thing. It adds drama. It adds randomness. It makes it more like long shot. What's the most famous play in the history of soccer? When the guy freaking hit the... The, the, the hand the of God. Right. You can't use your hand. The most famous play was a guy cheating. Most likely. Because he didn't get caught. And people love that aspect of the of game. Of course, in the NFL, the most famous play was also cheating. Yeah. But NFL tries to fix that. NFL soccer tries to fix its it. problem. Soccer likes... It braces it. Let's talk about another sport. So, Who race <laughs> Who knows the rules of race walking? Anyway, okay. okay. Race walking is such. You have to run a race, but both your feet have to be on the ground the whole time. So, so you're going you like, cannot lift up your back foot until the heel of your front foot hits the ground. Then you can back foot and completely come off the ground and go forward. Also, the leg that is touching the ground has to remain straight. And then you can bend the knee after. You can't you know, keep it straight like, like you're walking. You just basically have to walk as fast as possible. This has been an Olympic sport. This is a super popular sport. It is not an Olympic sport. sport any longer. Because as bad as the Olympic Committee is, right, and they're super bad, they know this isn't a sport. Nope, no, 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 no. <laughs> Some people already point out, you know what's funny, thing, funny about this picture? Anything, anything funny about this picture? <laughs> anything going on in this picture? Zoom and enhance. Now, zoom and enhance. I did not cherry pick. That is the picture on the front of Wikipedia about this fucking sport. <laughs> and it turns out that everybody cheats at this sport. If you want to be a race walker, just go jog. And basically your job is jog when the ref's not looking. Now, this is bad at being a sport, and here's why. It would be trivial to stop the cheating. I mean, fencing has the electronics. If I hit Scott the millisecond before with my right away, those big lights yeah. and everything People, go off. You know, a lot of these sports act like we don't have this technology. It's not precise enough. It's like, no, we fucking invented all this shit, right? <laughs> we have everything. We can know if, like, one you know, nanometer of the soccer ball has crossed the line. We can know that. We have that ability right now. But yet, in race yeah, walking, no. we could trivially make shoes where if both of them are off the ground at the same time, it just shows up on someone's computer, you're disqualified. Now, the, that. the community around race walking act actively fights fixing their officiation problems. The judges, they're human judges, they're not allowed to bend over. They're not allowed to use mirrors. They're not allowed to use binoculars. They're not allowed to use cameras. They are not allowed to actually report that they have caught someone doing it in real time. They have this whole complicated system of individual judges have to walk over and tell the head judge, I saw number four cheating. Even if everyone tells you, you might just not find number four before he crosses the finish line. Yeah, they have to physically go and get to number four who cheated and stop him before the end of the race in order to do something about this, right? And cause a penalty. Now, I would postulate that if they officiated this sport perfectly, it would no longer exist. Because everyone walks at the same damn speed. <laughs> That's why we have running. So, Settlers of Catan is a pretty bad game if you're smart. Yeah, it's pretty awful, actually. Now, you know, we talked about... being sarcastic here. We talked about Yahtzee, but, I mean, you play Settlers, it's a great gateway game, but it's bad at being a high-level test of skill. If you play Settlers a few times, you'll start to notice, notice that in the tournaments for Settlers, once you get past the first few rounds, nobody's really trading with each other anymore. Because there's no incentive to ever trade unless you're ripping the other guy off. And if you're all good players, you're not going to let anyone rip you off. And if you're trading perfectly equally... 
then it still doesn't have any impact on the game. Right, imagine if you trade perfectly evenly with someone. So you have four players. Players one and three trade evenly with each other. So they get ahead of players two and four. Why would player three help player one widen the gap against player two? They wouldn't. Right? There's no combination of two players that would trade with each other to boost themselves up. Maybe three and four would boost themselves up together, right? Okay, so now they're no longer three and four, they're now two and three. But it's like, okay, you, just, you the number three, number four guy just helped the number three guy go to two. He didn't get himself to one, right? So it really, you're just sort of voting on who's going to win, and it's not going to be you. Now, with Settlers, the thing is, you might think, oh, I can be clever. No, you can't. Settlers is bad at having a high-level endgame. There's a point where, if you play it enough, you'll be as good as a human can be, and there's nothing you can do to be better at the game. The only thing you can do to be better at the game is be really good at rolling dice so that your number comes up all the time. Now, this game is still a great game until you get to that point. But once you get to that point, it's no longer a good game for you. The reason you can't be clever is because game theory, this game's actually pretty simple to analyze. In game theory, you assume that all players are equally clever. So if you think, oh, I could trade with this person, then this person in this pattern, and I'll come out ahead, they realize the exact same thing you realize. And there's no way to be more clever than someone else. Yeah, we're talking about four perfectly smart players, which is us. But again, look at the levels. This is a great game. It was a great game for me. For years, I loved this game. But I have no desire to ever play it again. Yeah, because I figured that shit out. If you haven't figured it out, keep playing it. So, what is this? do we want games that are just 100% hardcore skill? It seems like that's what we're getting at, what yeah, we like. This game is 100% awesome. Are you, uh, you know, how much skill do you have? It's like, even my level of skill is not enough for this. I mean, he has the like, power cosmic and he still can't bring and beat his ghost. Really? <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense. But basically, if you don't know this game, it's a sideways, you know, shoot em up game. And it's blisteringly hard. It's one pixel of, like, the ground touches the Silver Surfer surfboard. And you think those ghosts are just following a nice pattern? No, they're all... <laughs> <laughs> so then they went back to... That's how powerful those ghosts are. They can reach into the real world and sit the slide back. So, this is, a, this is an ortho game in the extreme. And is it good? No. <laughs> right? Because the difficulty is unfair bullshit. Silver Surfer is bad at being a hard game because it's not fun at being a hard game. Super Meat Boy, if you play it all the way through, is about as hard as this in many points. The difference is Super Meat Boy is designed very well. That little mechanic where every time you die and you start over again, when you finally beat it, you see the replay of your million failed attempts. How many of you keep playing to beat a Super Meat Boy level because you really got to see that? The more times you've died, the more invested you are in finally finishing right. it. And, and also, you don't let's get any fucking sleep. Try a whole bunch. The Silver Surfer. It's like, okay, you have to pick which one of the guys you're gonna go for. Is you pick? Okay, I'll pick Mephisto's level. And I died. And now I have to re. I already beat the Lizard's level. I have to redo that again too. Right? It's just unfairly hard. And the stuff that kills you. It's like you just have to memorize everything. Imagine if you had to beat every Super Meat Boy level in one shot. And if you didn't, you went back to the first level. Yeah, it wouldn't be a popular game. You can die three times, maybe. It doesn't matter. So Go. I'm going to say that Go is a bad game. I also say Go is a bad game. So Go is bad at having directional heuristics for beginner and intermediate level players. Right. So this, this heuristics are basically things you use to help make decisions in a game. Here's right? an example. You guys, you can't do math. Humans cannot do the kind of math you need to do to analyze games. When we talk about analyzing games, you'll do some calculation to a point, but you're not calculating the entire state of a game. You're using a heuristic, a sort of fuzzy logic, a sort of simple rule like, if the game is in this state, I will do things like X, Y, and Z as opposed to H and I. Humans do this. It's how our brains work. There's something in humans called the, uh, the gaze heuristic. It's how we catch things. If I toss... Oh, I already threw E.T. out. So if I threw E.T. out into the crowd again, and someone wanted to catch it, they're not calculating the trajectory. Humans cannot predict where something will land based on where it was thrown quick enough to catch it. We cannot do that, but yet, humans catch shit all the time. <laughs> How do we do this? The gaze heuristic. Human beings will, unconsciously, without thinking about it, if you toss something to a person, look up at it and lock their gaze at an angle. As long as you keep your gaze locked at an angle of an object following a ballistic trajectory and move forward or backward to make sure that angle stays the same, you're guaranteed to have it hit you right in the eyeball. <laughs>
<laughs> so you back up and then you stop slightly short and then you can trivially catch it. That is how you catch stuff. You're not calculating anything. Board games are the same way. Yeah, think, uh, I'm trying to think of a heuristic, maybe in Settlers, you're like, if I have one of the four resources necessary, I build a settlement. As a directional heuristic, it's a heuristic you use to make a decision in the game, right? And as you play games, once you start a new game, you don't have any heuristics. But you play it, and you start to say, oh, if, if this happens, I'll do that. And you start to build a system of when, I, you know, in Mario, if there's a pit, I will press A to jump. If there's a big pit, I'll run backwards, then hold B and run forwards, and then press A. It's now, like, chess, a similarly abstract game, has at least a tiny analogy that's built into the game for someone who hasn't read the rules of, I'm trying to kill that king, I got knights, I got castles, I got a queen who's really badass, and I'm going to go get that guy. So you have this analogy from the real world of what to do. So you think, all right, I'm going to start moving my guys forward and try to get that king. You have a very simple first-order directional heuristic. Go get that king. And then you get fools mated, and now you have a second directional heuristic. Don't get fools mated. <laughs> and you can build and then you these have a third one. I'm only going to make a move if I kill more of his guys than he kills my guys. Then you get another one. I'm going to move in such a way to where he'll move to a position that I can capture a guy. Yep. You start to use these heuristics and use increasingly complex heuristics. Go, if you try to just start playing Go without someone who already knows Go teaching you, you're basically acting randomly for most of the beginning of the game. Until the game, like on a 9x9 nine nine board, or even on like a 3x3 three three board, some people. You're going to act randomly until you've gotten to the point where you can calculate the rest of the game. And then you play perfectly and the game's over. Go is really bad at getting beginner players to play. Go requires, for the majority of people, an expert to teach someone how to play who or knows books. how to teach Go. A lot of people who play Go just read books constantly so they can memorize these patterns. Because if you try to get, you won't get directional heuristics in like the first hundred plays. You won't have even anything to help you make decisions. You'll still be playing randomly unless you're super, super smart. Now see what right. we did here. Go is a great game. Go is an amazing game. But even Go is bad at something. There's no perfect game. So we talked about directional heuristics, which is what do I do now? Mario Kart is bad at having positional heuristics. Who, who is, is winning? winning? Who is winning a Mario Kart? Is it the guy who's really in first place? Is he winning? No. Blue, Blue Shell. Shell. <laughs> is it the guy in second place? Well, it depends which Mario Kart, because in some Mario Karts, Blue Shell has AOE. Yeah. That thing right there, that list of who's winning, that is a first order positional heuristic. It is a lie. If you're playing shoots and ladders and one guy's near the end and the other guy's near the beginning, but there's a ladder that goes right to the end, who's actually winning? And it turns out that's really complicated because there's no such thing as catch-up mechanisms in games. If you could have caught up, you weren't behind. There was just an obscured positional heuristic. The, part, the point spread around the edge of the board was lying to you. So game, Mario Kart is a great game. And your directional Depends heuristic. On Mario Kart. I have a really good directional heuristic in Mario Kart. I'm gonna go really fast. <laughs> yeah, Mario Kart directional heuristics, no problem, right? Go as fast as I can, stay on the road, use any shortcuts I find, use all my items to shoot people, try to make them hit, right? Uh, I'm losing, go backwards and try to ram somebody. <laughs> <laughs> That's called griefing. But the positional heuristic is really obscured, so people play Mario Kart and complain that, oh, that was bullshit, I was winning the whole game. No, you weren't. And then I lost because of BS. No, you were not winning at any point in that game. You just had a much simpler and less accurate direct positional heuristic in your brain than the actual one in the game. These games tend to be unsatisfying to smart people because you figure out a more complex positional heuristic. Usually, they're really complicated. Even Settlers has this problem. Who's really winning? The guy with eight points or the guy with seven points and he's one away from longest road and one away from largest army? Who's really winning the game once it's not an obvious thing to do? It's not go fast, press A, get the puck in the goal, score the touchdown. The games become, un become unsatisfying because the thing you're doing isn't the thing you want to be doing. You're hanging back in power grid to jump ahead later. The vote who wins the game. Vote who wins. Four people sit around a table. Do you want Rem to win? No. Do you want him to win? No. Right? If you just straight up voted to win, right, no one would win. It would always be three votes against one for every vote in a four-player game. Any game that is not a team game, that is more than two players and is an ortho game, is a vote who wins game. It's in called politics. Yep. So if there's a three-player game of Advance Wars or something, 
Uh, any two players can collude against the third player and eliminate them from the game, immediately increasing their chance of winning from 33% to 50%. And the end game of pretty much any non-two-player game becomes, I can't win, my action will either hurt the person in the first place, making him lose, or will hurt the person in the second place, making him lose. Right, so basically one person doesn't get to win because the other two players voted, he will not win. And then, that person who will not win chooses amongst the two players who are, one of them has a chance of winning, which one of them will win. Right? So, so it's like, we, you know, we got a third person here, me and Rim say third person ain't winning. Yep. Now third person decides, well, is Rim going to win or is Scott going to win? And it doesn't matter what we do. Unless you're really incompetent, that's what's going to happen. So politics exists in any game that is more than two players. Ever notice how all the famous, super high level games are only ever two player? It's because of this problem. There is literally teams. no way around this problem. Any three or four player game might not be political early on because you're still exploring the game, you're good at the game, the politics don't matter until it's too late. Age of Steam eliminates players that can't win anymore, so they can't grieve. Right, so Mall of Horror is literally a game where you're in a mall, zombies come at you, and you vote to who to kick out of the rooms into the zombies. Right? Uh, Small World and Vinci both have this problem to a huge degree. You can pick a winner in Small World. Vinci, you can pick a winner. It's easier in Vinci because you see the score the whole time. Small World obscures the score, so you can only be political if you have a more complex positional heuristic and you're counting how many points everyone's been picking up. Yeah. It's public information, the game hides it hoping you won't pay attention. Okay. Counter-Strike. I fucking love Counter-Strike. I've been playing this game since before the P90 was in the game. This is my favorite goddamn game. And it's still a bad game. If you come to me and say, hey Rim, Counter-Strike is just a really complex head-clicking game. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> I'm not going to pretend it isn't. That matters. Learning to click on heads is more important than any amount of tactics in this game. All right. The tactics only matter if everyone has already mastered the clicking on heads. If you've got ten guys who are click on head masters, then yes, all that other stuff, which guns you choose, which path you take, where your teammates go, suddenly all that stuff matters. If you can't click on heads and one guy can, his team wins. If I play on a pub server, I walk in, I'm like Neo. I just walk around like ba-bam, ba-bam, ba-bam. I play on a pro server, I'm that guy who dies in the first 15 seconds. So Counter-Strike, just, I just want to make this point. I love this game. I accept that there are some things about it that are, that are objectively bad. It has flaws. It has problems. If you tell me Counter-Strike has bad aspects, I don't get mad at you. But how many people out there get really mad if you tell them their game has a problem? If you tell them that their MOBA isn't the best game that was ever made? Right, they try to argue with you, like, no, oh, no, it's good, no, you suck, right? They take it personally when you, right, because they identify with this thing that is outside themselves. Like, I'm a Counter-Strike person. You insult Counter-Strike, you've insulted me. And it's like, no, you're just not looking at the world objectively. It's okay to like things, everything has flaws, nothing is perfect. Don't get personally insulted just because I insult some shit. So right? let's go into something else. Team Fortress 2. We're running out of time. I hate this game. <laughs> and here's why. Hey, and clicking doesn't matter. Now we're going to be very specific. This is why game reviews are so important to not use numbers, but to use a sort of, you know, explain why the reviewer likes the game. Because if you know what kind of person the reviewer is, and you read their review, and they talk about their personal, non-objective, 100% subjective experience, backed up by objective facts, that's actually a good review for you. Right, so here's what happened with Team Fortress 2. Team Fortress 2 has, like, these random crits they added in, right? So it's like, randomly, when you hit someone, then you might get a critical hit and they'll die. When they did this, without putting any visual indication that in the happened, beta, they in just the beta, added. right? As they did this, they were testing. People liked the game more. It was more fun. People said they liked the game more. They said whatever they you changed. changed. The game, they added the random crits. They said, "Do you like the game more?" And they said, "Yeah, it's way better now." Now those crits added randomness, reduced the impact of skill in the game, but it made the game more fun for about eighty percent of the players. Then they revealed, "This is what we added." That top tier 20% of players who were really invested in the skill part of the game quit because the game was more random and that was bullshit as far as they were concerned. Right. Team Fortress 2 is not good at being a test of skill the way Counter-Strike is. Well, a test of certain skills. It's not good at testing skill-based movement. It's not good at testing head clicking. It's not good at testing individual skill because if you're a reasonably competent FPS player, you can basically play your role or your class perfectly for all intents and purposes. It is good at testing your wallet to see how many hats you can buy. <laughs> now, as a result, this game is bad at testing all those things. It's bad at being the kind of game that Rim likes. It's really good at being a team game. It's really good at being fun. 
If I, if I you're really play, good at being silly. If and... I play this game with 10 friends, they we have to work as a team. It tests your ability to play with a team, to have a team strategy. You two defend, we're gonna go attack with these classes, here's our plan to get the Uber. All those parts are great. Those parts exist because we made all the other parts worse. The, the tests of skill were moved to a different area, and I hate that. We have seven minutes. This game doesn't have the movement stuff, it doesn't, the, the characters are huge, the maps tend to be small, characters are really slow, you have limited ammo, it's not hit scan, there's huge spread on weapons. And this old game does the exact opposite of that. So you might think that this is really. game. Does even know what Weapons Factory is? Okay, so, it's a Quake 2 mod, it was crazy. Team Fortress 2 is the successor to Team Fortress, which was a Quake 1 mod. Then there was Mega Team Fortress, Weapons Factory was the peak of that genre of gaming before it disappeared. Weapons Factory does the exact opposite of Team Fortress 2 in every regard. The player models are tiny. They move ridiculously fast, 10 times faster than anything in Team Fortress 2. All the weapons are hit scan. You have like 15 goddamn weapons and five different kinds of grenades. You have grappling hooks, so the game is all in 3D all the time. As a result, this game, the team tactics mean jack shit. Yeah, you think head clicking matters in Counter Strike, right? It matters it's like ten times more than head clicking Weapons Factory. One guy on Weapons Factory, it's like if I'm really good at Counter Strike and head clicking, okay, I can kill two to three guys around who aren't as good as me, and then I'll die because I took too much damage, right? In Weapons Factory, I will kill the entire other team every single time. I will never get hit by anything ever. Right? Because I'm flying around in 3D like lightning. They won't even see me on the screen. There'd be like a grenade behind them. I'll knock them into the air with a rocket where another rocket is already there to meet them. <laughs> and that's a basic play. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's like the, the, all, the skill of the moving around is really all that matters, period, end of story. So two parts of the game. This is a bad game for people who like individual skill tests. This is a bad game for people who want to have a life, and it's bad for people who want to have a team-based skill game. Tribes 2. Possibly my Our favorite, favorite game, game ever. ever. How many of you have ever played Tribes 2? Oh, yes. Because Penny Arcade kind of talked about Tribes 2 a lot over the years. And that arc's right, actually getting kind of old. <laughs> Tribes 2 is a big deal that nobody talks about anymore. Look at how many fucking Penny Arcade comics there are about Tribes 2. Now, I want to point something out here why we're saying this is a bad game. Because remember when they used to they use these rewards? They haven't done that in a while. Best game until they fucked it up. <laughs> Tribes 2 was bad at being a game you can still play. DRM made this game impossible to play. It disappeared. Right? A lot of times there's nothing wrong with the game itself. There's something wrong in the meta of the game. The thing around the game. Perhaps the community. Heroes of Newer. Right? Yep. There's a, there's a lot of games that have these sorts of problems. And Tribes 2 is one of them. Right? The company running Tribes 2, they had a forum built into the game. You didn't even need to go to a website. And they would, the people who suggested things in that forum, they actually listened to them and did what they said. And they fucked up the game. They, they also game players are not game designers. They also gave mods first class treatment. So people started playing more mods than the classic game. Fractured the community, which meant you couldn't find a good game anymore. And this requires a ton of people to play, at least to play a good game of it. Yeah, in order to play a game of Tribes 2, you need like 40 people all there at the beginning because the server was huge, the map is huge. You need everyone there at the beginning. You need everyone to stay for like 20, 30 minutes per match, right? It is really hard to get a good game of Tribes 2. But even harder today. Adventure games. These are not ideal games. That term I used before, because your playthrough is not unique. The same shit happens every time you play. You can pirate adventure games by watching them on YouTube. I do that. I because love adventure games. I have loved adventure games, but the fact is, they're just movies, and the puzzles are usually really simple and really straightforward. The ones that push the boundary a little bit are some of the later King's Quests, the Quest for Glories, Police Quests and Space Quests were more like simulators, but they all have this problem. They are great at being interactive amusements. They are not ortho games, they are not ideal games. Right, if you look, go and watch. A lot of people who made like the great all-time adventure games have given PAX keynotes or PAX story times, if you go back to keynote. Uh, and all of those people, they were not necessarily inspired by video games. They were all, every single one of them in their keynote, because I was at those keynotes, mentioned Star Wars, like number one thing. Those are people who wanted to tell stories. They're not people who are into games. They knew programming, which is why they ended up telling their stories in the form of software, right? But they didn't make games where there was competition and skill testing and all these sorts of things we're talking about with Counter-Strike and whatnot, right? They basically made movies. They made shows. They made artwork. 
right? And it, you know, it's just, it's good at being that. It's good at being an entertaining story, you know, that thrills you or gives you all sorts of emotions or who knows what, you know, like a movie does. But it's not good at being a game. All the puzzles are just annoying nonsense. Imagine if you went to go watch a movie and every five minutes it's like, we're stopping the movie now. Solve this ridiculous puzzle and we'll let you watch more. You'd be like, fuck that bullshit. We're not doing that. That wouldn't fly. Pandemic is a shit game. <laughs> Pandemic is plain up garbage. Like, more than Here's why. Game, maybe soccer is Now, all these really? games, Shadows Ever Camelot, even the Battlestar Galactica game, because the games all have bad rules around information sharing. So as a result, one smart player can tell everyone else what to do. And in, like, Shadows Ever Camelot, where there's a traitor, if anyone doesn't do what he says, they're obviously the traitor, or they're stupid. And you played Pandemic, one dude can just tell everyone what to do. There's no reason for it to be a team game. Imagine, if you're, playing, imagine if you're playing Solitaire, like, the, you know, Microsoft Solitaire, and basically what you do is you take turns choosing what to do next. That's what Pandemic is, right? <laughs> it's not actually a co-op game. It's a take turns Solitaire game. It's garbage. Hanabi. It's trying to be a co-op game, and it fails miserably. Hanabi is a co-op game. It won the Spiel des Yard this year. Game it's a tiny of the card year. Game. Just go buy it and play it. It is better than any co-op board game. It's the only been. real co-op game I've played in a long ass time. MOBAs, bad games. No. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> really briefly, because we're all running out of time. MOBAs have bad spectator heuristics. Unless you know what the fuck is going on, these games are terrible to watch. I go to watch some League of Legends and it's just like explosions, colors. Ooh, there's more colors right now. Something must have happened. Compare it to say football. Even if you know nothing about football, watching the game for a couple minutes, you figure out the basics of what's going on. You can enjoy football on a level. We went to AFL, right? Australian football. We knew what was going on within like a minute, and all we did was read like the first paragraph of the Wikipedia page. <laughs> Pay to win games. Magic the Gathering, Yu-Gi-Oh, all these things. We were in the Rochester Institute of Technology. There's a game store called Millennium Games. There was a Yu-Gi-Oh tournament. Yu-Gi-Oh is a pay-to-win game. The game store owned all the cards that were out. So we constructed a deck of the best cards money could buy. Well, the game store did. Yes, and entered into the tournament, being played by our champion here. And that Vanilla Coke won the game. It won the tournament. <laughs> it's bad at being a test of anything except wallets. Borderlands has all the restrictions of an MMO, but it's not an MMO. I can't play with Scott because my guy's level 10 and he's level 50 even though it's not an MMO. Also, you can solve every problem with patience and the sniper rifle. Yes. <laughs> Me Plaza, how many of you are playing this right now? It's Candy Box. This game is actually this game. The game is called Candy Box. Same game. I highly recommend you look up what Candy Box is and then stop playing 3DS WiiWare games. Also, if you want to play Candy Box, learn JavaScript. You can win like in five minutes. <laughs> so, and right now, the Omegathon is bad at being a test of skill. It is not for testing skill. It is for entertaining all of you. So, if you ever complain, oh, it's all random in the beginning? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Just like game shows. We're done. They're kicking us out. <laughs> We gotta end this. Obviously, we can't take questions. Come grab a flyer if you have a question, if you wanna follow up, if you wanna see the slides, you wanna see They're the other videos. Leaving. We didn't make our concluding point. And our point is simple if you're gonna hate on stuff, explain why you hate on it. If you can't say why a game is bad, don't say it's a bad game and shut up. If you like a game, like I like these games, accept the valid criticism. I respect that these games suck in some ways. If you like a game and you can't say why, you should probably look at your life. <laughs> Thank you. That's it. <laughs> you did it? Uh, if you kept it and watched that, no one would have done anything. Yeah. I've got like 10 of those. I forgot about eating myself for the different Atari games. Seriously. You've got that that was the best Atari game. I lost it. It was a Rex Oz. Yeah.